This is Jeff Bard with Bill Weinberg of Counter Vortex. And we're going to talk about the state of the left and the problematic divide between the tankies and those of us who are consistently anti-imperialist. Uh, we originally were both involved with the Ukraine Social Solidarity Campaign and similar related projects against Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Now we are faced with a situation with Israel bombing Palestine and plausibly a genocide in progress. So when we look at the demonstrations, the people out on the street seem to like, you know, they're basically spot on when they talk about Palestine and they're completely full of nonsense when they talk about Ukraine. And a lot of them even don't support Ukraine's resistance. And among well, these- when, when you say uh, the people out on the street, we don't mean all the people out on the street. We mean the uh, particular leadership of certain organizations, <clears throat> which have unfortunately, uh, you know, insinuated themselves into uh, influential positions. For instance, you know, by, well, I mean, they always get to the police permit first very frequently for the uh, for the protest. And even if they didn't call the protest or get the police permit, they'll flood the protest with their uh, mass produced placards, which have Wait, got their, be, let me interrupt for a minute for the list phone number and website on it, et cetera. Bill, and let I'm me interrupt you for a minute. Go ahead. Uh, you you said PSL very quickly. It was hard to even know that you said PSL. So the Did listeners I, would want to know, you mean the Party for Socialism and Liberation? Yes, the very poorly named Party for Socialism and Liberation, more accurately termed the Party for Fascism and Dictatorship, which talks a good, go a good line on Palestine, but actually supports aggressive warfare when we're talking about Russia in Ukraine and supports occupation when we're talking about Russia in Crimea and Donbass and uh, and makes excuses for uh, the uh, bombardment of civilians when we're talking about uh, about what Russia is doing in Kharkiv and Odessa, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I mean, they're very blatant in, uh, in, in their propaganda on behalf of the Putin dictatorship. Well, and, you know, but, but portraying... Uh, you know, uh, Russia as the aggrieved party and um, <clears throat> and, uh, and 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 Ukraine as a as a Nazi state, which is, of course, a reversal of reality. Let me let me let me roll you back, roll it back a little. Now, it's true that uh, the, the PSL, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, they turned out at the Oakland city council hearing for the resolution and they turned out for the early demonstrations in, in places like manhattan but i would argue that they did some damage in fact oh, they did a lot of damage. They're doing damage of course they did a absolutely. lot of damage yes to say the least and if i may i want to share with the listeners who may not recall that even the governor of new york was brought in to condemn in part because of PSL and also the Democratic Socialists of America were named, uh, and I'm not entirely sure that they were culpable of uh, any particularly egregious but errors. Did, so did, did Hochul actually mention these groups by name? Uh, well, they may not. I don't know if they named them, but it was the the episode was sparked by something Eugene uh, Perrier said. And he gave a rousing speech to a crowd, and, and it probably included PSL and others. It may have had the, the, the black and yellow signs. I don't know if it's Answer or International Action Center. But whoever it was, he was speaking to. And he started out, and you're thinking, wow, this guy's an eloquent speaker. He's rousing the crowd. But soon, right hot on the heels of the October 7 episode, he characterized the uh, individual that would that were involved uh, with breaking through the fence as the resistance by land, by air, and by sea with hang gliders uh, and really like lionizing. And 
I prefer Norman Finkelstein's take. This was the concentration camp inmates breaking out. They were doing bad shit, things they shouldn't do. Uh, but it, we uh, we don't excuse it, but we explain it. Finkelstein has got problems of his own. Look, right, I mean, I'm not as... Issue, uh, wait, let me finish my point. Yeah, Finkelstein... Uh, even on this issue, Finkelstein... Uh, you don't like Finkelstein, but hear me out for a second. He, I don't like Finkel, of, Finkelstein opposed... For all of his hot air on on the question of Palestine, when push comes to shove, he opposes BDS. I know that. I know that, and that's a problem with him. And 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 you know, there's, there's all this loose talk about uh, you know <laughs> Gaza is a concentration camp. Now the Gazans, it appears, are about to be pushed out of Rafah across the border into Sinai, into an where actual. The, uh, where, where the Egyptian authorities are actually preparing real concentration camps for them. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're figuratively. Gaza is, you know, Masha Gessen more accurately describes Gaza as, uh, you know, the equivalent of a Jewish ghetto during, you know, the Nazi times. Uh, and now, if I, may, then, I mean, you kind of cut me off. These are metaphors, so you can't get that precise about metaphors and comparison similes. But but Finkelstein is the person who first uh, editorialized and made the analogy of the Nat Turner Rebellion. And I believe that is quite an apt comparison. You think about it. The Nat Turner Rebellion was a horrible, ugly episode. Perfectly, I mean, you can't say perfectly innocent. People were complicit in the slavery system, just as Israelis are complicit in the Zionist imperialist occupation. But people who are, you know, not full of evil intention were brutally murdered But during the Dan Nat Turner Rebellion All right, well, yeah, 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 and on October 7th. So I would give Norman Finkelstein credit for that. And he's a hell of a lot better than Alan Dershowitz. Well, so why rant about Norman when you've got Dershowitz running around? Saying you're more stuff. forgiving than these of all these characters than I am, apparently. Well, let's let's put a spotlight. Now, the problem with Norman Finkelstein and BDS is that if you look at the, the demands of the... First of all, we need to clarify. People get very confused. BDS, capital B, capital D, capital S, is a very specific movement, very specific organizational leadership, and very specific demands. Norman Finkelstein, as most people, agree that boycotting is a... Good, legitimate, nonviolent tactic, and he supports can that. We have to talk about, can we? I, I, I no, a lot of people are that. confused because I know you're really down on Norman Finkelstein, but I want to give credit where credit is due. Can, can we do it again? This start over a fourth time and steer clear of Finkelstein. Why you hate him that much? Look, I because can edit. It's a whole other convert fucking station. Oh God! Why don't you just let me finish this one point? On BD to clarify, because I do like Norman Finkelstein. I, you know, his book on Gaza is amazing. He he feels that if you take the demands of BDS to their logical conclusion, there would be no more Israel, no more Jewish state. There would only be one democratic state from the river to the sea. And he apparently. Well, this is this is the big contradiction with him. On, on one hand. He's, you know, um, grandstanding with these Nat Turner analogies. And on the other hand, he's, uh, you know, he's defending the notion of a Jewish state, which I do not, by the way, I will point right. out. Can right. we like I disagree with him on that. I'm with you on that. But he's but, still. And, and, and I'm also not into uh, making uh, you know any excuses for what Gaza did on, on October 7th. And if that puts me in a slim minority, I don't care. No, very few people are making excuses, and I don't think well, Norman too many Finkelstein, people are. You, Finkelstein, yeah. wait a minute. PCO is probably making excuses. I, I would buy that, but I wouldn't say that Norman Finkelstein is making excuses. I think he's explaining why that, why these people went crazy, berserk, psychotic. You had to be psychotic to be doing one tenth of what allegedly occurred but we don't even know what occurred because there's so many lies that have been coming out of the israeli we know enough to know that it was horrific it was inexcusable and, absolutely and, and illegal under international law and if you want to you know split hairs about whether um or you know or make a big deal out of out of whether babies were beheaded 
You know, I mean, is the Israeli propagandists kind of shot themselves? If that claim is in fact made up, the, the Israeli propagandists kind of shot themselves in the foot because now that you know the, the apologists for Hamas can can legitimately say, oh, there were false claims which were invented. When what Hamas did that day was horrific enough that you don't have to make up any false claims. It's exactly what I've been ranting about. You know, on the other side of the coin, people on our side, quote, unquote, who have been, uh, you know, propagandists on our side have been creating these Facebook memes and, and whatnot with, um, uh, you know, uh, with AI imagery, you know, a, you know uh, artificial intelligence creations uh, of, uh, of, of, of Gaza atrocities. And now, you know, Israel can legitimately say that, uh, you know, images of Gaza atrocities are being, you know, are being are being fabricated. And, well, and we're going to see more of that. Point us to fabricate them. There's enough actual ghastly images from Gaza that you don't have to fabricate them. The genie's out of the bottle, Bill. There's going to be an onslaught of AI generated, falsified not only photographs but videos and yeah, it's stop with trying to cheer me up jeff uh you know i know you're you're actually would it be fair to say you're somewhat of a doomer much as labels are deceptive you seem to own the concept that we're doomed uh but the reality is uh that the propaganda is we're now beyond mere propaganda they're actually creating whole new realities uh, for people, and they're manipulating not only their beliefs, but their emotions. That's been going on a while, but it, it's more so now. They're getting into people's psyche. And like Antonio Gramsci talked about ideological hegemony as um, establishing really, he didn't use the expression, but establishing an overturn window of what is an acceptable thing to say and what is considered to be common sense. And um, with you know AI, they're they're pushing the limits of, you know, what you can do and like what constitutes direct action in one person's mind is a horrific crime in another person's mind. But um, I think that uh, another interesting uh, thing that will piss you off and 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 pit, really cheer you up at the same time would be that the most widely discussed early claimant that the Israeli Defense Forces fired upon Israeli citizens on October 7 was one of your favorite people to hey, so to speak, would be Max Blumenthal. But actually, I subscribe to Haaretz, so you viewers don't have to. And Haaretz is full of venom for Max Blumenthal for making that claim early. And as it turned out, there have been other commentators who have come out and support it. More evidence has developed that, in fact, the IDF did fire on Israelis on well, October well, there, 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 are, there are claims that that happened. Actually, it's being investigated, apparently, by the Israeli security services themselves. But it was not it, – it, it's being completely blown out of proportion. This notion that, you know, October 7th was some kind of like a false flag conspiracy or something. Well, nobody said it's a false flag. Oh, yes, they are. Well, no, Maybe I mean, your Facebook friends aren't as stupid as mine. I'm definitely seeing that shit. Well, you can sue a ham sandwich, and I'm sure that's an and, and And, and, and it's, it, 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 this was a small number of people who were killed in friendly fire by uh, the IDF, if, in fact, it happened at all. Yeah. Well, there's another claim, and I, I'm not vouching for its veracity, that there is a, a policy that is sometimes enforced. I think they call it the Hannibal Directive. And the claim is that the IDF has a preference if uh, there's someone that could be taken hostage by Hamas, they prefer to kill the person rather than let Hamas get a bargaining chip uh, for negotiations. And I, I have no idea if that's true or if that's being made up. This is like the fog of war on steroids, and you're quite right to be alarmist about the role of artificial intelligence. I don't think I'm being alarmist, unfortunately. I'm raising the alarm. Yeah, in yeah, that yeah. Sense, yes. Well, I'm with you on that, and it's only going to get worse, and we're, we're going to need countermeasures and means of uh, vindicating authenticity. And, and aside from that, there's other ambiguities, like, you know, I mean, uh, Navalny is dead. Well, you don't need artificial intelligence to um, try to obscure that. And I'm sure that 
the Russian Federation is going to come up with some kind of an excuse. And on the other side, you know, there, you know, Gonzalo Lira, I believe, uh, didn't he die in custody? So um, we don't know what to believe because there was a whole. Right, well, you should you should make clear who he was. Uh, Most of our viewers are not going to know who Gonzalo Lira was. Yeah, I, I wouldn't ordinarily want to platform him at all, but since he is out of the picture, it's not going to hurt. He's a a Chilean guy that was living in Chilean Eastern... American, I believe. Chilean okay. American, uh, you know, war blogger who um, was uh, taking a very pro Russia position, a uh, very anti Ukraine position, but was in Ukraine apparently and uh, uh, disappeared, and I believe is now uh, presumed dead. Right? It was proven that he was killed. Is apparently so, again, but it was like, he's, is he dead again? Because before they were saying he was dead. Right. And it turned so, out which, he was. He was in with suspicion falling on the Ukrainian security services. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And the suspicions are there. But I've seen this guy on his podcast, and you know he had a very refined knowledge of the intricate vulnerabilities of Ukrainian tanks. And, I mean, he really talked like uh, in a way that made me wonder why he was not in custody in Ukraine, because he was basically plotting for – death and mayhem for Ukrainians. And yet he was released to my amazement. I, I, I would just feel that a, a nation that's at war, if somebody is getting into military details, you know, what would it take for him to, to start sending coordinates in? And, you know, I found a guy on Twitter openly taking videos of Russian, Russian missile strikes in such a way that people, they could be geolocated by the Russians could then, uh, you know, target their artillery and missile strikes more accurately based upon these video clips that were going up on Twitter. And I tried to get it to stop as other people did. And this guy didn't. And the way this guy was identified, I don't really want to say on air because I feel like it might have been some sort of a false flag thing um, to get people to hate uh, a particular group of society. So I'm not even going to put oxygen into that. But uh, you already anyway. have. So what else do we want to talk about, Jeff? Well, we got Navalny's dead. We don't know, but we it looks like a hit. Um, we you know, you know so you've got. Uh, well, once again, as we said in the last take, this is now what our third take. <laughs> uh, well, don't whether don't. or not, whether or not Navalny was actually poisoned or beaten to death. The fact that he died is not unrelated to the fact that he was in this, uh, you know, Arctic uh, prison camp, you know. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, and there are many, the, many the, other the, the, the Russian state bears responsibility for his death, even if he wasn't, you know, in the narrow sense of the word, assassinated. It's not like, you know, he was sitting on a on a bench in Gorky Park and he kind of keeled over, okay? He was in an Arctic prison camp. Probably not the most salubrious place. <laughs> All right, so we've we've discussed we've discussed uh, PSL, but another group that that does put boots on the ground, protesting the Israeli uh, ethnic cleansing, would be Code Pink, and right now a uh, at least one member is facing felony charges for protest at Nancy Pelosi's house, where she uh, I guess was spilling paint or fake blood and a few drops splashed on a police officer and she's being charged with assaulting a police officer which is like a little old lady yeah 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 it's kind of ridiculous but the it, it, it's problematic because uh fash busters and alex reed ross writing in uh new politics uh, a year and a half before the new york times exposed code pink's rather uh suspicious relationship to uh, Chinese uh, money. And when the New York Times story came out, Mark Well, Chi Rubio, Chinese state propaganda efforts. I mean, that, that research was really spearheaded by, uh, by Alex Reed Ross. Yeah, before, yeah I mentioned. Yeah. Before, yeah. before the New York Times. Right, 18 so, months before the New York Times. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, blew, blew it up. Yeah, yeah. New York Times then claimed that it re revealed the results of its investigation, but Alex had already done the work. At any rate, then Marco Rubio picked up on it, and he sent this letter to the FBI demanding they investigate Code Pink. 
And people kind of thought it would go away because everybody knows Marco Rubio is just a jerk. But then Pelosi had to do the real stab in the back by escalating that into um, something that she was going to endorse, which now makes it a bipartisan matter with two well, heavy Pelosi weights. Pelosi is now calling for, well, yeah, but since, since the attack on her house, you mean, her house was, a, was an attack with red paint or something like that? Actually, I believe that they were two separate incidents. There was one incident where at her car, Code Pink was there and Pelosi said, go back to China where you came from or something like that, which is horrible way to speak as a Democrat. And then I believe it was a separate incident because they've been protesting on a regular basis at her place. And it was very bad timing because one of the uh, high points of the protest was um, uh, one year after her house was in, invaded by that right wing guy. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it was it was a, a very poor planning on the part of Code Pink, and I mean, yeah, a case could be made that they should be looked into, but the whole tone. It, it's it, Pelosi was painting with well, broad who did you by whom? I'm not, I'm not here calling for uh, you know sicking the goddamn FBI on no, COVID. no, but I mean, Alex, Alex investigated that <laughs> as a journalist, yeah, and exactly. It, Thank yeah. you, and that's the level well, it's, it's, of it's an important, it's important distinction to make here, given that you know you've got uh Rubio calling for the FBI to be sicked on them. That's not I'm that's not what I'm calling for. That, well, that, but even it, but you did characterize it that they're you know part of the Chinese propaganda machine. So there right, are but some I, I, who would argue. I think that I think that you know that researchers, independent researchers, need to look into that and spread the alarm on them to uh, you know raise awareness among. Oh well, yeah, that's exactly who my might point. Otherwise, be taken in by their propaganda. Yeah, I do not believe that constitutes a being a foreign agent, which is what they're accused of. And being a foreign agent, that agency means like you're a puppet, like you're doing what. There's nobody in Beijing that's telling Medea Benjamin what to do. She's doing not, what she does because she believes in what she does. And the same with Jody Evans. And the notion that they're foreign agents, I think, is far-fetched. So, right. It's a question I'm not particularly concerned with. Well, I know, because the anti-campus left is really uh, not at all uh, willing to try to articulate as nuanced a working relationship with the campus as might be required in order to beat back the fascists and to beat back the state. So we're going to have a problem on our hands if Trump gets elected in large part. To say the least. Yeah, and uh, there's a very good chance Trump will get reelected. At this point, last I looked, Biden was sinking rapidly. Yeah, don't polls. remind me. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like we're going to have four more years of Trump I'm much more concerned. Let's not be too fatalistic about it, okay? It's the election is still several months away, and you got to be real doomer if Bill Weinberg is telling you don't be fatalistic. So I I don't know. Maybe I just don't don't want to tempt fate. I don't make predictions. You know, I'm a big advocate of of knuckling down and and hardening, uh, target hardening for the inevitable, or almost inevitable, four more years of fascism. Of some sort, uh, right, creepy well, I, fascism. Oh my God! Well, depends what you, again. It's a question of definitions, I and mean, we You could argue that we have creeping fascism under Biden, but it would be galloping fascism under yeah, Trump. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't want to. Say, and I don't want to say that his election is, you know, inevitable because I don't think it is. For well, even with Biden, I, I think that we have a big problem on our hands with our freedoms. With free speech is imperiled by groups like Canary Mission and. You know the Anti Defamation League. All right, was, tell me about tell us about Canary Mission. It's it's a uh, an organization, with some dark money. For a while, people weren't sure where the money was coming from. That was going after uh, mostly students who were taking part in the uh, pro Palestine student movement over recent years, and basically ruining their careers. Were trying to ruin their careers by distorting what they had said and making it sound anti-Semitic when it was really just criticism of Israeli state policies. In some cases, sure, they probably caught out some people that were really saying stupid shit, you know, they should, that was anti-Semitic. But I think for the most part, these were sincere, nuanced, thoughtful students 
who are concerned about the uh, mistreatment of Palestinians by the state of Israel. And many of them were even Jewish themselves. And, you know, they would put, you know, put their picture up and uh, what they allegedly said distorted in such a way that when they go to apply for a job and their name is Googled, it pops up. Oh, this yeah, person. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, but it's not just uh, them. There's the doxing truck people that started in Harvard. Then they went down to Yale. And now I guess they're on a national tour. But everywhere they go, their trucks are getting spray painted. And uh, Were uh, they at Yale? I know they were at Columbia. Here they went down York to Yale, Yale, yeah, and Columbia. And uh, for that matter, you know, I mean, you have this, this kid that was uh, in the law, uh, NYU Law School who got booted from her position in student government. She had a job offer, which was retracted. And you had, um, you know, this kind of stuff going on on campuses around the country. Meanwhile, another organization called the Brandeis Institute, this is crazy stuff, this. The Brandeis Institute is suing Berkeley and other colleges, trying to get them to crack down on student groups, which are... Uh, anti-Zionists and decide that when they invite speakers, they're not going to invite speakers with their group, you know, treasury. They're not going to hire speakers who are, who are Zionists. And that's their kind of their prerogative. That is their freedom of speech. But the Brandeis Institute claims, makes this crazy claim that's really sort of an anti-Semitic trope. They claim that Zionism is integral to Judaism. And therefore, these student groups are excluding all Jews. And, and so this is this is just ridiculous because we have a lot of people who are like even on the pro-Israel side who are or you know at least staunchly anti anti-Semitic uh who are against anti-Semitism, who are saying, look, don't blame you Jews. You mean staunchly opposed to anti-Semitism. That's what I said, yeah. yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. And they're saying, do not, it's anti-Semitic if you equate what Israel's doing, which maybe is not so great, if you equate that with Judaism or you blame Jews for that, that's anti-Semitic. Don't do it. So, okay, yes. duly noted. Duly noted, yes. right? But yes. the Brandeis Institute is turning around, they're coming around, and they're saying the exact opposite they're saying, oh, no, no, Zionism is integral to Judaism, and therefore, if you're opposed to Zionism, you're automatically an anti-Semite, and furthermore, you're creating a hostile environment, and furthermore, you're violating federal law because you're making it impossible for Jewish students to go to that college, and you're excluding Jews, and you're horrible segregationist. Yeah, 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 well, that's pretty sinister. And well, yeah, I mean, it's just crazy because it's, it's, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. It's one or the other. And so, uh, but they got a lot of money behind them, and they got this, um, you know, lawyers all over the place. And so, I think they're going to get thrown out of court on their ear. But you know, they're a pest, and uh, some of these college administrators are not so smart. Uh, as for instance, the ones that were in front of Stepanek in the Congress, you could not help but wonder how these people became college presidents. They give such stupid answers. When they're asked, is genocide, advocacy of genocide ever okay? Is it ever justified? And the yes, obvious I know, is never. I know, I know that was an extremely painful episode. <clears throat> <laughs> How do such stupid people become so powerful in academia? I mean, anyone would know the answer is never. You can never. There's no con contact. My my thinking is that they were briefed by the lawyers who did not anticipate that angle of attack in the questioning, and they had a stock answer, context, context, context. They agreed beforehand that was going to be the response, and they were just under the in front of the lights of the cameras. They just tensed up, and they reverted to that. So here we are, and the primary, the loudest voices opposing the genocidal, uh, plausible genocide, the clear ethnic cleansing against the people of Gaza are people like PSL, Code Pink, 
Um, well, not entirely. I mean, come on. Let's let's uh, also make note of the many others. legitimate voices out there. Of course, Jewish voices for peace. Jewish not voice for peace. Thing. Exactly. Uh, not in our name. You know, a little more moderate. And then there's some well, Israeli. I, I wouldn't even say moderate. Just better politics. Not. It's not you, a question of moderate versus extreme. Exactly. You think, you think not in our name is better politics than Jewish voices for peace? I would think the other way around. Uh, I, that that I that wasn't the comparison I was making. I was com comparing them to uh, the the illegitimate groups, the, the 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 tanky factions out there, which are sort of exploiting the whole question of Palestine in the first place. Well, tell us more. Now we mentioned PSL and Code Pink, but there's some other players, and you're very knowledgeable. So I'd like to hear you talk on that. Tell us about. Um, International Action Center, I think. Are they still active? They're still rolling out, right? They're part of it. And uh, the name is slipping my mind with the yellow and black signage. I don't know. Yellow and black signage. I don't know who you mean. Um, answer Coalition. Is yeah, the Answer Coalition. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, as again, I think as we said in an earlier take, this whole, this whole lineage goes back to the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956 to put down the popular uprising there. And the uh, the elements, of, particularly of the Trotskyist left, particularly the Socialist Workers' Party here in the United States, who um, supported the Soviet invasion of Hungary, broke off to form initially the Workers' World Party, uh, which has been, you know, can continue to take a uh, a, a pro an, a pro dictatorship uh, and pro war position. You know, uh, they supported Saddam Hussein in um, uh, during Operation Desert Storm. Then they supported Milosevic and Radovan Karadzic during the wars in uh, the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, and then um, uh, Bashar Assad in Syria, and you know now Putin. And Xi Jinping today, um, there was a factional split a few years back. They were there. They've always had Workers World. Always had a kind of like a front group to draw in the uh, you know the the neo fights. Back in the nineteen sixties, it was Youth Against War and Fascism. Oh, yeah, I remember they that. Formed, they formed they formed a new one with Operation Desert Storm called the International Action Center. When of all people, former Attorney General Ramsey Clark was their big um, front man. Um, uh, who I actually you know, went, actually went to uh, to Baghdad to schmooze with Saddam, and then went to Yugoslavia to schmooze with Karadzic, former Yugoslavia. So, um, and then after nine eleven, uh, IAC became like the IAC, which is itself the International Action Center, itself a front group for the Workers World Party, became the core of a new organization which was launched international action i'm sorry the international answer for act now to support act now to stop war and end racism which should actually be act now to support war and encourage racism so uh completely orwellian they started out i think as kind of uh, semi-legitimate but uh, they it quickly became clear that they had been you know co-opted by the IAC, which in turn was co-opted by, uh, or just got actually an organ of the Workers' World Party, and certainly by the time of the uh, the Arab Revolution in um, in 2011, it became very clear that uh, they were on the side of the the dictators in certainly in Syria, they were and and in Libya, they were on the side of the dictators. So um, now a few years after that, there are some, I don't remember exactly when, but there was a uh, a faction fight within the Workers' World Party um, and the PSL, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, or as I call it, the Party for Fascism and Dictatorship, broke off from Workers' World. There wasn't really any um, political content to the split. It was just kind of a uh, about ego and turf, and there was kind of a, an East Coast, West Coast element to it. So it was kind of like, you know, Tupac Shakur and Notorious B.I.G. I'm so, shocked uh, that personalities played a role. I'm exactly. Shocked. What's that? Shocked, shocked. As in yeah, the yeah, famous yeah, yeah, Casablanca yeah, yeah, yeah. scene, his personality. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So, um, and, uh, you know, Workers World was had more of a presence here in New York and PSL had more of a presence in California. And, uh, and, and they split at that time. Uh, and in the divorce settlement, it seems like PSL got International Answer or the Answer Coalition, as it's variously called. And, um, and uh, Workers World got the, got the IAC, the International Action Center. Since then, since their politics are basically identical anyway, pro-Putin, pro-Assad, pro-genocide, <laughs> um, they, uh, they, they've kind of formed a, a new organization called UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition, uh, to try to you know, come together again under a, um, a single umbrella. And it was um, it was actually leaders of UNAC who actually attended this confab in Russia, uh, this Eurasian so-called Eurasianist confab in Russia, and met with elements of the uh, both European and American radical right. And um, hey, Bill, wait, we're up against the time stop. I want to keep this going. Do you? So hang in, and we'll do part two. What I'm driving at is there are threats to our freedoms and freedom of speech um, around a new set of issues, and we need to be uh, leery. We do need to combat anti-Semitism in all its forms, but obviously, that well, we have to be clear about what it is and what it isn't. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And you know, there's a well, problem but... with you know, with certain people on our side, quote unquote. Who were just, you know, it's like glibly repeat like a mantra anti Zionism is not anti Semitism, as if that's all you have to say about it. No, anti Semitism actually exists and needs to be opposed as well. It isn't just, you know, some propaganda charade created by the Zionists. But uh, we also have to be equally clear in, um, in resisting this attempt to conflate anti Zionism and anti Semitism. So uh, there's kind of like twin traps we need to avoid here. So, you know, it's important that we, um, you know, try to bring some clarity to these questions, which is what uh, I guess we're attempting to do in our work. You through uh, these three volumes, which we have uh, desktop published. What are you calling yourself? The what archive? Bastille Press. Right, Bastille Press, but also and something it's... archive. Yeah, it started out as the Ukraine Resistance Support Archive, and now it is the United Resistance Support Archive. Uh huh. United Resistance Support Archive. Very good. And what are the three titles again? The running fast. Okay, we've got stand time. with stand with Ukraine, debunking the propaganda. And it was your idea for that title. And then the second one was Ice on Fire, Ukraine, Russia. Israel and Palestine. Ice on fire. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a riff on Winter on Fire, which is a really good film about Ukraine. And the third title that's just dropping uh, tomorrow, <laughs> um, the second anniversary of the 2022 escalation of the 2014. The massive war. Russian invasion of Ukraine, February 24th, 2022. Yes. And that, uh, and that last one is going to be called what? Victory in Ukraine, uh, peace in Ukraine, victory over the new fascism. Peace in Ukraine, victory over the new fascism. Very good. And of course, my rantings can be uh, heard uh, weekly on my podcast and um, read weekly on my blog, countervortex.org. The notion being that the world is going down into a vortex of permanent war, ecological collapse, and stupidity due to total, you know, uh, propaganda saturation. And, uh, you know, through our conscious resistance, we try to create a counter vortex and generate energy moving in the, in the other direction towards peace and sustainability and intelligence. So. There we go. We well, have I to set up a two out of three. I'll go. For, I'll take peace and sustainability. You need, even you from dummies. Need, the thing you're not going to get the peace and the sustainability if we're all being duped by sinister propaganda. That's rather the point. The the, the whole three all kind of go together. Anyway, 
it's after four o'clock in the morning here in New York, and I have to go to bed because I'm really tired. But yeah. uh, it's been interesting schmoozing with you. To be continued. Uh, to be continued, yes. <laughs>